morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the session 7AC, uh, what's new in ZOS version 2.5, um, which will be presented by our dear Marna Wally, mm -hmm. uh, who so gratefully um, accepted our invitation and made the extraordinary effort of waking up early to present her present us her session. So thank you very much, Marna. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And, and thank you for not, and I know it's early, but it's still reasonably early in the United States now. And we are only four hours away right now for one week. So thank you very much for attending this session and also learning about ZOS 2.5, because this is our latest and greatest release. And it's really only been GA for a short period of time. And we've seen a lot of people move to 2.5 already. So we're real excited about that. But what I really wanna talk about today is all the great new functions that are in this release. Because once you get there, I really wanna see you start to exploit items. So my name is Marna Wally and I work in the development organization in Poughkeepsie, New York. Usually I get to go to GSC UK, but now this is the second year in a row I have not been there and I really wanna get there next year. So hopefully I'll be doing a session like this next year in, in Whittlebury. Um, a couple of things, uh, my email's on the cover. If you have any questions at all, just drop me an email and I'll get you the answer. If I don't know the answer, I know a lot of people who probably do. So that's pretty easy to, uh, to get through. Also, another thing is this is a lot of material. Um, we have spent a really long time developing ZOS 2.5. And so to talk about it in an hour is really not giving any one area justice that it really deserves. So what I've done is I've selected what I think are the most um, uh, important areas or the ones that might be of the most interest to the most people. I have provided a little bit of information about that, but I've hidden a lot of slides. A lot of the functions we've rolled back, some of them were rather old that we rolled back. And so I've also hidden a couple slides of the PTF was more than, let's say, about a year old. I'll, I'll take those ones back because those are not, that's not new information. So again, I've got 132 slides. The 132 are on the proceedings on the website, but I'm not going to present 132. I think I've got it down to about 50 or 60, which I think I can do in an hour. All right, so let's get started. First thing I want to understand and explain to you, I want you to understand, is that we have a couple of acronyms here. So the blue CD that you'll see here, this means that they were ZOS 2.5 items, but they were done early in the ZOS 2.5 cycle. And so what happened is they were put rolled back into APARs, probably on 2.4, and in some cases they were rolled back onto 2.3. So that means that they were called continuous delivery, they had an APAR and they rolled it back. So if you're on 2.3 or 2.4, chances are you've seen some of these functions already. And I wanna point them out because that's stuff that you could use today on 2.3. Now the red CD means that we're not finished actually with some of the 2.5 items. And we will be putting those in PTFs on 2.5 and those will also roll back to 2.4. They probably won't go back to 2.3 at all. Okay. And then the other item uh, acronym we have is SOD then that stands, it's a statement of direction. So that means we're still working on those items. Okay, so that will mean uh, they'll come out, but I'm not exactly sure which release they'll go out. They'll go probably on 2.5, um, but it's just a statement of direction uh, general so that we have a little more time to work on those. And then this little monitor screen, it says one, two, three, those are our content solution pages. And if you don't know what a content solution page is, it's a very high level technical uh, web page where you can find all the information you need very quickly about what it is, even how to do a, the little bit of the setup and usage of the function as well. So it usually spans many books and we needed a content solution to give you an idea of generally what the function is. And we've got a lot of content solutions out there for some of the larger functions. So you'll want to take a look at that. When we look at 2.5, what is in the release? Well, we have a lot of stuff in 2.5. And when we look at themes or areas where we have functions, we have chosen to put into 2.5 a lot of uh, functions that are in the workload enablement so that we can have ZOS actually use workloads from other platforms. Sorry about that. 
And also we can participate in a hybrid cloud environment as well. We also put enhancements for intelligent resiliency or availability, as you know, for ZOS. So we will keep on with that as well. Oops. We also are always looking at security. So we wanna look at cyber threat on security for Z. So that is another big area that we have in ZOS 2.5. And always something that I've been working on specifically is management simplification because we want the operating system easier to manage. And we want to make sure not just a more experienced system programmers can do things faster and easier and less error prone. We want the early system programmers to be able to do that as well and be productive as soon as they get to the platform. So this is the general chart where we go specifically into particular areas of functions on ZOS 2.5. And what I've tried to do is for each one of the enhancements, put it underneath its category on the slides that you'll see subsequently. So let's start with the release overview. So what we're gonna do for the release overview is I'm gonna to describe to you where ZOS 2.5 will IPL. And this is very, very important. So you have to IPL ZOS 2.5 on a Z13 or Z13S or higher. I get a lot of questions about this, you know, oh, I have an EC12, BC12, can I IPL 2.5? You cannot, there's no way around it, okay? We look for the machine facilities when we IPL, and if you do not have those machine facilities, we will wait state, okay? There is no way around that. There's nothing we can give you to do that, to bypass that code. We need that code on Z13 and Z13S and higher that is provided from that machine level. So that is a hard requirement. If you are not on a Z13, I would recommend you do a hardware upgrade first. Okay, so 2.5 is on Z13. Um, and also, as you can see, we're good with all the other releases on Z13 as well. So let's move a little bit into the hardware support because a lot of what we do in the operating system is we make sure that we're providing advantage and benefits to what you see across the entire stack. So what we've done for Z15 is you can see in ZOS 2.5, we can now have up to 16 terabytes of memory. Talk about that one a little more in a, min a minute. We have improved compression performance because as you know, on the Z15, we have the NXU chip, which allows us to do high-speed compression. We have more coupling uh, links and more chip ids on some of the higher end models. We've got more enhancements in the CFCC for thin interrupts and monopolization avoidance for resiliency as well. We've got the ability to monitor and address with a slip command for a range or when a key change has occurred and then take a diagnostic action. The sort accelerator on the Z15 has been very helpful to us in the area of DF sort. So we are going to use in DF sort the new sort L instruction which is provided on the Z15. And this will allow you to exploit DF sort uh, enhancements so that it, we can use that machine facility itself. In the world of crypto for the Z15, first of all, we're going to uh, change how we're delivering the crypto support for hardware from here on out. Thank goodness. We are not going to do web deliverables anymore so that you have to, you know, acquire those from the web and receive, apply, accept that FMID yourself. We're not doing that anymore. What we're doing is we're going to put all the crypto support in PTFs and now when we have the PTF support for the newer hardware, we can identify them with a fixed cat, just like you do all the other PTFs for the new hardware for the Z15. So we're real happy that, you know, crypto is now joining the family now on fixed cat. So I think that'll make it easier for everybody. You can also hear, see here a lot of the crypto enhancements that they've done for more signatures and uh, hash base message authentication code as well. And you can see the APAR numbers here. They're all marked with a fixed cat though, so you don't have to scribble them down. So let's move into the area of usability and skills. And when we're thinking about usability and skills, we're usually thinking of ZOSMF. That's our big item in this area. If you are not using ZOSMF, absolutely you need to get onto ZOSMF. Um, because it's very important. We'll talk about how we need to install ZOS 2.5 coming up in a minute. But the desktop for ZOS 2.5 has a new look, and it is what is the required interface for ZOSMF when you get to ZOS 2.5. 
So we've got groupings that you can put into folders. You can customize your own folders. You can submit a job uh, when you are browsing a data set or a member or a file. Uh, you can look at the output within the desktop itself. It has syntax highlighting so that if you see a web link, it can be highlighted. You can click on it and go directly to that web page. We have the ability to do type ahead search, which is particularly useful to me since I do uh, not remember always the name of my data sets or files, so I can kind of pre-prime the names as I start to type it in, which is very helpful. I can create a data set from this desktop, and I can like as an existing data set, so I don't have to remember all the attributes of the data set. I can have additional browser support. I am a Chrome user. I have always used ZOS a month on Chrome, even though they told me that it was not supported. I have always used Chrome because that is my browser of choice. Finally, now ZOSMF says Chrome is going to be tested and we will announce that we support it as well. So that makes me very, very happy. So we have Chrome, Firefox, and Edge. However, other browsers will use as well, and such as Safari, and they'll be able to work. So you should have your browser of choice be able to be used with ZOSMF. We have much better ability within ZOSMF to granularize its configuration itself through the interface. So I do know that we have the IZUPRM PARMLED member and there are configuration options in there, but you can also configure it through ZOSMF if you uh, want to do that in a more graphical way, which is very handy. We've had startup improvements for performance. We have been hearing for a very long time that ZOSMF takes a long time to initialize and we understand that. And we have had many, many APARs. You can see the numbers in the middle of this page uh, that have put we've put out to increase the performance of the initialization. Also, it helps if you're using a Z15 and you have system recovery boost and you start ZOSMF up in the first uh, minutes of the IPL in which system recovery boost is occurring as well. So you can see with these APAR numbers that we've improved time by 30% and reduced CPU time 48%, which is really good. We have the ability to do dynamic PARM lab updates. We know that the server uh, should be available a lot and we didn't like to have to stop and start the server when certain things happened and changed. Uh, configuration options on ZOSMF. So we have a set IZU and a set space IZU command and also associated with it, we have a display command as well, which is very helpful so that you can see what the server is running with and since when it has been running that way, it's been very helpful. We have a new plugin for DFSMS RMM in ZOSMF. And one of my favorite functions and one is that is the most helpful for system programmers is the security configuration assistant. This works with all three of the external security managers, and it can tell you for the certain functions within ZOSMF, whether a user, any user that you, you fill into the top here, or a group ID has permission to use that function. And we know that the security work on ZOSMF is very difficult to set up. And if you miss one thing, the whole thing may not be usable to the users. So when you look at the security configuration assistant, this really helps with debug to identify whether the security is the problem for why the function isn't um, properly behaving. So if you have not tried security configuration assistant, please try it. A little bit of a chicken and an egg in order to use the security configuration assistant. Of course, you need authority to use it, but once you've got the authority and you're in there, it should be much, much easier to do. So love the security configuration assistant. The other new option I like as well is the diagnostic assistant. So oftentimes when you open up a problem or a case with IBM for ZOSMF, they will say, oh, I need to use the ZOSMF logs and I need the job log. I need to see all that information. And this is the instructions on how to do it. And they'll give you all these instructions on how to gather that information. Well, that's all manual, but not with the diagnostic assistant. So when you click on the diagnostic assistant, it'll just say, okay, what do you want to do? What kind of diagnostic information? Click, click, click export, gathers it up, zips it all in a file, downloads it to your workstation, and there you go. You can just upload it to wherever you want for the investigation by the, the, the service people. So I absolutely love this function. If you do need to open up a case, this is where you're going to want to go. 
I love this function as well. There's a lot of great functions in ZOSMF I really, really like. And I like the Sysplex management function as well. Um, I like to be able to view things in a very graphical and picture manner. I like to see that on my uh, web browser and I can do that with Sysplex Manager. So I can see uh, each one of the systems. I can see the CFs. I can see the links. I can see the structures and I can drill down and look at that particularly. It's just really helpful. Not only can I view it, I can also do some modifications as well. So I could do things like rebuild or duplex or reallocate um, structures if I needed to. Really helpful to do. Those are done with commands underneath the covers. And you can see those commands. You can see the output of the commands. So if you want to drill all the way down because you're somebody that really likes to see exactly what happened, all that capability is there within the Sysplex management function of ZOSMF. New to ZOS 2.5 is the Sysplex CFRM policy editor so that you can edit, edit the CFRM policy, including the structure sizes. You can do bulk editing. You can do uh, increases of a certain amount or as a relative size. I'll show you a screenshot of that next. Um, and also it will do some best practice checking for you as well so that you don't have to repair it after it's happened. You can see it before it's changed within the ZF, uh, ZOSMF CFRM policy editor. So you don't have to run that batch utility anymore. This is two screenshots of what it looks like. So here, when I'm modifying multiple CF structures, I can see here the absolute value so that I could change numbers to be you know, an absolute minimum size. But on the right-hand side, I can do it relative so that I could do bulk editing and add 15% you know, to what I've, I've decided to change. So this is very helpful, and this is how users have identified that they want to be able to do this to us. The consoles is a little bit older, but it has had some enhancements to it. So with an EMCS console, you can be able to see the syslog and the opera log within ZOSMF. There's support so that you can have a particular area of the screen, just have the WTOR and the hold messages appear. And also it can help divide out and search and find console messages much, much easier. Now, the big thing in ZOS 2.5 is that we will be able to install ZOS 2.5 with ZOSMF. Now, I've been talking about this for years and IBM and all of the major software vendors, we've all gotten together and we're all moving in the same direction and that we will package software known as a portable software instance. And that is what we have done in ZOS 2.5. And that portable software instance will be available to you to install with ZOSMF. And some vendors have already moved on this path before IBM. So we're coming into this game as well. Now, remember we had server pack, right? So a server pack, a ZOSMF server pack and a portable software instance, they're exactly the same thing. We're having a hard time in IBM getting off of the term server pack. And I really wish we would, but it's taking a long time in every little location to change you know, ZOSMF server pack over to portable software instance. But with this installation method, you will be using ZOSMF in order to do the install. So you'll need ZOSMF on your driving system. However, for a short period of time, just between now and the end of January, we will offer both methods, both the old fashioned server pack in the custom pack dialog and the new ZOSMF server pack portable software instance will offer both of them. So if you really don't have ZOSMF on your driving system yet, after six years of having ZOSMF in the operating system, uh, you still can get the older one. Well, you will have to order it quickly because it will be not available after January. Okay, what would I say that you do? I would say go get ZOSMF on your driving system. I would say try out what a portable software instance is so you're familiar with it. We have not had labs at GSE UK, and I keep trying to get them, but I know we don't have them. And usually at other conferences, we have labs so that you can try out to install a portable software instance, but you can get it from this content solution at the bottom here. We've packaged a very small portable software instance. If you install that on your driving system requirements, it will do the verification and make sure all your security is set up and you can become familiar with how to install it. Thereby, when you get the larger ZOS 2.5 system, you'll be able to understand and move on it quickly. 
it is best if you do not <laughs> try to install ZOS 2.5 the first time through with ZOSMF. You really should learn about it ahead of time, okay? We found that for early customers, those that installed ZOS 2.5, never having installed anything in ZOSMF, they didn't really understand what was going on and that didn't turn out to be the best thing for them. So I'm strongly gonna recommend that you get the little server pack that's available on the website, try it out, understand the flow and the process and what's happening. Then you'll be ready for ZOS 2.5. Also in that area, we can have an interface, a user interface within ZOSMF to install PTFs. This is really wonderful. So let's say that you wanted to use a user interface to put PTFs on, not a batch job. You can still use the batch job, no problem at all. The batch job you've had for 30 years, you can still run that job. But if you have another way that you wanted to do it, maybe someone new on the team wanted to try a user interface, you could put on corrective recommended or functional fixes through software update within ZOSMF itself. And there's an entire content solution around that as well. So uh, what we've also done is we've provided the upgrade materials. Remember a long time ago, we had the migration book, but we don't have the book anymore. We have the upgrade workflow and the enhancement that's happened in 2.5 is that we put that workflow right into the product itself and we put a PTF against the BCP back to ZOS 2.3. And you can find that workflow in the user LPP BCP upgrade directory once you've put the PTF on. Now, how do you find the PTF? It's identified with the coexistence fix cat, which is a fix cat you guys should know and love and been using you know, ever since you knew you were going to 2.5, you've probably been using the coexistence uh, fix cat. So you probably have the uh, workflow on already. As we provide updates to that workflow, we'll keep using that fix cat. And as you run report missing fix for that fix cat, you will find the new workflow updates to there. And remember, you don't have to start from scratch on the workflow. Every time we update it, you can do a create new based on existing where you can take your old work that you've already completed and you can take the new workflow and you can create a uh, merged workflow where you see your old items already done and the new items come in. So, so remember that, that's a good thing to know. We have a new plugin planned as the statement of direction called the ZOS Management Services Catalog or MSC. This is a fabulous new function I'm really excited about. What we have the ability is we'll leverage workflows, but we're gonna leverage them such that it's really easy to implement a workflow. So you can go through with a workflow and you can define what variables or options you would like it to run. So let's say you have a workflow for allocating a ZFS, right? And it's just a job you've been running for 30 years and it's like, oh my gosh, do I have to keep running that job and be disrupted by somebody that wants me to allocate a ZFS because they're not allowed to or mount a ZFS and I have to keep running this job and it disrupts me and it you know, takes time. Wouldn't it be easier if I just let them do it themselves? Yes, that's exactly right. So what you can take is you can put your job into a workflow and then you can define your workflow properties that you want for your individual enterprise, such as I want every workflow to start with ZFS as my high level qualifier. And I want all my ZFSs to go into the storage class. You can identify that within the workflow and in the management services catalog that then becomes a service. And then you can permit people to run that service that you would like to be able to using the requirements that you had encoded into that service. So it's really, a, really an awesome. You do need to understand how to use workflows because the first time you provide the service, what's underneath is really a workflow. So this is very, very powerful and it also can help uh, give more busy system programmers more time back to allow their users to have more kind of self-service services to them, which is really awesome. And that's coming soon. We've got in the incident log, the ability to specify case numbers. Swagger is a really awesome interface so that you can look at REST APIs if you're interested in writing programs uh, that use the REST APIs for ZOSMF. We have a change password API now. And if you happen to use the ISPF uh, ZOSMF, 
function, we have the ability to identify application global settings, if you like, so the users don't have to know individually what they are. We've got more REST and data set file updates so that we can allocate it like a data set within the REST API itself. We can uh, have data set and file compression capability so that we can help over slow links. Uh, let me move, keep moving here because I know I've spent a lot of time on, on some of the other items. A lot of workflow updates, type ahead, um, automatic deletion when you've finished a workflow because you don't want to have too many workflows in your background. What, something I really like is what I call a deep search so that I can search not just in the step title, I can search inside each one of the workflows if I'm looking for a particular step. And that comes in really handy when you look at a workflow like the upgrade workflow. If you wanted to look for a keyword like RUXA, and you can find that deep inside all of the upgrade workflow steps. Uh, if you're going to run a workflow on a remote system, you don't have to use single sign on anymore. You can use your user ID and password to log on to the other system in order to run. There's a ton of workflow enhancements. All right, moving on out of uh, ZOSMF, but still staying in usability and skills as we have continually worked on trying to reduce the number of assembler exits that we need. And we're still continuing on that with a JES2 policy. So you can see on the right, the example of what a JES2 policy might look like. It looks a lot like JSON. And you can put that into a data set, like a ParmLive data set, and then you can use that source, uh, that policy for all the systems that you have for JES2 and hopefully get rid of some JES2 assembler exits. It's much easier to read. So if you look on the right hand side, you can read this as, you know, if I have a protected job, then I'm going to do some modifications to it. I'm going to change the message class to A, and then I'm going to send a message that this job name now has message class A. Okay, so this is kind of an example. And this is really easy to read, much easier than assembler would be for somebody to have to maintain. We have policy control statements within JES2 so that you can add, delete, or change policies. Um, they can be MAS or MAS wide definitions of these policies as well. Also, we have additional C headers for SMF records uh, that be generated by ZOS. So this is very helpful if you want to use C to access SMF records. One thing that is particularly exciting, and I know a lot of people have been waiting for this anxiously, I'm waiting for this anxiously, is we have a statement of direction for something we're called data set file system. Now this function will satisfy requirements that are at least a decade old. Okay, And this is something that you probably want to pay attention to because you might have wanted this function. So what it is, it's a new file system type where you can essentially map a data set to a Unix file name, right, a path. And then what you can do is you can use any utility to reference that path, and it will really map to a data set and then actually uh, perform, you know, the input or the output onto that or read to that data set as well. So if you think about things, we have had a requirement to have SFTP natively handle data sets for a very, very long time. However, if I take that data set and I match it to that path in this data set file system, I can use SFTP onto that path and it will go directly into that data set. No need to copy the data set into a file, then do the SFTP, and then, you know, on the other end, take the file out and put it back into a data set. You don't have to do that anymore because it's handling the data set directly with data set file system. First release of this function will support sequential PDS and PDSE. You can see the record format that will support here, F, F, B, F, B, S, B, V, B, and U, okay, as well. Okay, we can handle compressed and encrypted. Um, existing catalog data sets uh, can be read and written. The per, um, authority is done on the data set side, not on the Unix permission side. And there's some other things that you might want to read here as well. But this function is really anticipated. And I think a lot of people are going to wait for this one because it looks really awesome. And now every Unix tool opens up to accessing a data set directly, which is awesome. Transparent cloud tiering can do full volume support. So if you're interested uh, that you want to put 
your full volumes out to the cloud without incurring any ZOS cycles to do that. This is a wonderful function to do that. And this has been rolled back all the way to ZOS 2.3. So I mentioned before, we can go above four terabytes. Four terabytes has been our limit for quite a while, but in ZOS 2.5, we can go up to 16 terabytes. Anything above four terabyte is going to be in two gig frame sizes, okay? And anything that you have online at IPL above four gig, up to 16 terabyte, or sorry, up to, above four terabytes, up to 16 terabytes will be in these two gig frame sizes. So who would use this? ZCX is looking at this. Um, other applications that really need large amount of memories, this is something that you'll want to take a look at. Uh, we have more hyper -write link, uh, hyperlink write statistics that are available in uh, DFSMS and also in SMF records. WLM batch initiator enhancements will now take into consideration zip capacity if you have the WLM service uh, classes identified as ZIP users, we can now uh, take that into consideration when your initiators are WLM managed. We have SMF.py support so that you can use Python and Jupyter Notebooks to look at SMF data. This is really interesting. So now we can allow this analytical data to be available to different types of people if they needed to see it. Mount faster ZFS file systems. I've really liked this. When during deployment, you might have not unmounted or quiesced your ZFS file system when you're going to deploy it into a test or production environment. And what you would have seen in that test or production environment when it went to mount, it would have gone through a quiescing period to make sure that it was not shared like it might have been on the other system it came from. And that was a 65 second wait, and that was really long. And then everything underneath it would wait as well. So what that really resulted in was unavailability of the file system, which wasn't good at all. And a lot of people didn't like this. So we have faster mount of the file system. And that just is a PTF on your source and your target so that we know that we don't need to go through that 65 second wait anymore. Just to memory improvements. Uh, so we've put checkpoint structures uh, above the bar, private from data spaces, and this will eliminate the need to manage and copy them. So as well, so we're helping with virtual storage constraint relief that you'll see there. We think approximately about 50 meg below the bar uh, in just two might be saved to help with VSCR. More concurrently open data sets. This was done for DB2. So within the allocation component of the BCP, if you identify it, we can put some VCM linear data set control blocks above the bar so that we can have more of them concurrently open at the same time. So as I said, this is allocation support and it's not turned on by default. You'll wanna go into the alloc parm Live member and on system SWB storage, you're gonna to wanna to say ATB to exploit this. The default is the way that it was before SWA. We did that for compatibility, but you'll wanna set it to ATB. This can be done dynamically. And then there's a DB2A part if you wanted to exploit this function. Now RMF, RMF has gone through a massive restructure in ZOS 2.5. If you're an existing RMF user, what you will see is that all of the RMF functions are still exactly the same they were. You probably wouldn't even known that it has gone through a restructure because the functions are exactly there the way they are. However, when you go to order or you know look at the packaging of RMF, you'll see it's very different. So the RMF that we knew and loved, um, you know, in the older releases, it's now three pieces. We have a base piece that's called data gatherer that everybody can use. It's for free in the operating system down at the bottom of the operating system. Then we have a priced feature that's new called the advanced data gatherer. And then we have RMF, which is the existing function that we have today. So if you're an existing RMF user and you go into shop Z to order 2.5, you'll see that we have uh, RMF, and that's what you just do. You just select RMF and you're done. You don't have to worry about anything. RMF users will receive RMF and the advanced data gatherer function as well. So just you'll see in your IFA PRD Parm Labs um, statement that you've enabled for both priced features. Okay. So you can see that the restructure has happened here. 
Um, if you're an existing RMF user, just order RMF like you've always done and you'll see that you have the functions just like you did before. Oh, all right, we've got uh, a lot more RMF uh, enhancements and support for crypto and XCF transport class statistics, the monopolization of avoidance, and we've got health checks to help you identify that you're using HTTPS for the RMF DDS. What we've done is we've noticed that crypto comes up very early in the IPL and we wanted that to be eligible to use automatic restart manager or ARM. So we had to add some support in there to restart a system task in ARM. So that was done for crypto, but it could be used for other functions as well. Now the coupling facility monopolization avoidance, I've talked about that a little bit, that was introduced in a CFCC level 24 that was on a Z15. And that will help you if you had a runaway Sysplex application and it was taking up more than its fair share of the CF resources, we'd be able to kind of detect that and throttle it back down so it isn't a runaway application in your Sysplex. For BPX PRM, uh, we have the ability to identify to you automatically that you are approaching 85% of your system limits and allow you to a little bit of time in order to do automation or to up the limit or, or decide what you're going to do about that. And we also have finally syntax checking on your root and your mount statements in BPX PRM. So I've always loved the syntax checker in BPX PRM, but we wouldn't have looked at the PARM statements, but now we will in ZOS 2.5. There's been a nice big grab bag of the anomaly mitigation uh, that we've seen here. And this is both in the runtime diagnostics, which I hope everybody is running. It's a small component, please set it up on ZOS. And the runtime uh, diagnostics can give you some more information about what might be happening on your system. And it has the ability to do more filtering now so that you can look at just specific events on your system. Also, we have um, more report style uh, monitoring and evaluation of that as well. So RTD has been wonderful at providing us more information. It's a very easy to set up component. We also have RTD, which is being consumed by the predictive failure analysis function as well, which has additional uh, more reports that it can run in order to try to tell you about when you're gonna run out of system resources. So it's a wonderful two function uh, enhancements here that you'll wanna try. Catalog enhancements, this one at the top is something I know people have been waiting for a long time. They have wanted to change their master catalog out, perhaps to get rid of and better replicate. And they have had a hard time doing that because it really is available because of shared master catalog around the Sysplex and you don't wanna take a Sysplex outage to do it. Totally understand that. So what we can have now is the ability to switch a new master catalog uh, dynamically, which is really nice with the command. So here you can see F catalog comma restart, and then you specify the new master catalog name. Very, very helpful. This has been a requirement for quite a while that we do this. So we're happy that in 2.5 we have that. Also is another little extra thing. You can put a comment on the command and that will be you know, put into the syslog so that you can keep you know, why you did that master catalog change, or maybe it was associated with a record, uh, a case number or something like that, that you needed to do it. So you can put that comment in the line as well. We also have the ability to look through the catalog to see if there's any renames that are in progress occurring within the catalog. In IDCAMS, we've had a great function called delete mask. So it's, you know, we can delete things that follow a pattern uh, members that follow a pattern, which has been really helpful, but sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, you know, I over-specified my mask and now I've deleted more than I want. Give me some more control over this. I want to do a test. You know, before you do the deletion, just show me what you would delete, like a test. I kind of think of that, this is like an apply check, right? It's not a real apply. It's just an apply check. And that's what this is. It's a delete mask with a test, which is really good. And then also coming along with that as well is the ability to do excludes. So yeah, everything looks good here. This one member, I don't want that one member to go, but everything else is okay. So the test and the excludes are extra and they're really nice if you are a big fan of the leap mask like I am. Also in define model, we can model the key label because that's how we do data set encryption. And so you'll be able to model after that as well. 
and repro is enhanced to move buffers above the line to help with out of space conditions. Logical corruption protection, you might've heard about this where we can take safeguarded backup copies up to 500 them, of them, which can't be touched by the operating system. So they can't be corrupted. So you have some ability to do uh, TSO queries uh, that you can look at some of that stuff, but it's really out of the control of the operating system in case you have to do, let's say disaster recovery and pull the volume back. So that's, that's a very interesting function if you haven't looked at that one before. System recovery boost, hopefully you've used this one uh, because you're using a Z15. The original system recovery boost was for IPL so that you would have uh, 30 minutes of extra boost time at shutdown and 60 minutes of extra boost time at IPL so that we can shrink that window in which ZOS, uh, ZOSMF ZOS, sorry, is uh, not available. This also benefits ZOSMF. Um, and this will give you, if you're running subcapacity, it will move your general purpose prop processors up to full capacity. And then we would also blur that line and let ZIPS even participate in this so that we could have full capacity uh, general purpose, purpose processors and ZIPS also helping with this extra boost time at shutdown and at IPL. Um, we also had GDPS orchestration enhancements coming into that boost time as well. So now we have additional boost types so that it's not just for shutdown and startup. We now have ones that are uh, for system recovery, sysplex recovery events. So these are shorter times that you'll have boosts. You get 30 minutes of these per LPAR per day. And this would be for items like taking a system out of the sysplex, recovering from a CF structure for rebuild or duplex recovery. Um, if you had a data sharing member that was in a CF locking situation and you had to recover or disconnect that member because they had locking resources held, these are other additional types that you would want to throw these small system recovery boosts at. And these would be run again for 30 minutes per day per LPAR. Also hyper swaps included in there as well. Always, always what's the beauty about system recovery boost is there is no additional software license charge for using system recovery boost. So this is a great thing for Z15. Go look at the content solution if you need to see more about these types of system recovery boost. Okay, looking at my watch, I think I have about 17 minutes left. So let's just keep going. A new function uh, that we have in ZOS 2.5 is that we can provision an entirely new ZOS LPAR for you. You give us the LPAR, you point us to the ZOS uh, image that you have, the software instance that you have, we will create into that LPAR and IPL it an entirely new ZOS system. It's a monoplex at this point in time. We know we need to do more here and we'll create it from scratch. So we will use the best practices for starting up the functions that you will see into that particular LPAR. This is a really exciting area because we've heard from customers that they needed to create a new ZOS LPAR and they haven't done it in such a long time. They didn't know how to start. So if you give us the LPAR, we'll use your IODF and your RACF database and everything else will be created from scratch into that LPAR and IPL. So this is a pretty awesome capability that you can see here. And we know we need and want to do a whole lot more in this area. Um, I saw a demo of this. It's, it's really cool stuff. You do it with ZOSMF. The interface through this is with ZOSMF. Unix file and backup restore enhancements. We've had the Unix individual file backup in HSM for quite a while now. As users start to use it, they want a whole lot more functions into it. So what we'll have is the ability to do exclude criteria so that when you're pointing it to a directory, you can exclude certain files if you'd like from that. We also have the ability for the HSM host to process exclusively those Unix requests so that you can have your HSM host do more of the traditional stuff. And then your new Unix work can be directed to a different uh, HSM host. And you do that with a host type statement in HSM. 
Also, when you want to recover the files back, you can tell HSM, hey, I want to put that in a different directory. I don't want to overlay what I had now. I want to put it in a different directory because maybe I want to compare the two and see what the differences are. So we have the ability to identify new directory when it is recovered. In IEB copy, this was a very top customer RFE that we needed. We had 68 votes on this RFE. We had eight watchers of it. So customers wanted, when they're using PDFC version two generations, they wanted to be able to use IEB copy to preserve those generations. Previously, you would have had to use DSS dump and restore, but people are like, no, no, I use IEB copy for my PDSEs and I don't want to lose my generations. You need to have IEB copy support that. So indeed, that's what it's done. And it was such a pop popular item that we put it into an APAR and mold it all the way back to 2.3. How that is done is you use the GENS keyword, and this works on copy GRP and also copy group, either one of those. And the default, of course, is to have the existing behavior, which is not, you know, all the generations, just the current one. So you'll have to say GENS equal all if you want to use this function. For JES2 enhancements, we can do compression and encryption of the spool. We will do it in the right order. We will compress it first and then we will encrypt it. Um, and there is, this is just an extension of data set encryption if you're interested in it. And as I'd mentioned before, we have the policy statements. We've got better administration in ZFS so that the Chagger command we can do wild carding on, which is great. And also, this is an important one. Um, if you want protection from recursively removing files because someone did a recursive remove from the root on down, uh, we have control over that so that it won't cross file systems. Uh, we've seen that even on one of our systems in Poughkeepsie that you know sometimes users have 777 permission and someone accidentally goes up from the root and says recursively remove everything. And the next thing you know, it's crossed a lot of file systems and a lot of people aren't happy, even though they had 777 but this protection will be there if you, if you wanted to use that as well. PDSE version two member compression is available if you like. Uh, this is gonna use the ZEDC priced feature of ZOS. Incidentally, up at the top of this slide, when I was talking about the JES2 compression, uh, the JES2 compression does not use that priced ZOS feature. It uses the NXU compression facility that was available for you know, free coming along with C15. But the one down here, v PDSE member compression, that one uses the priced uh, ZOS, uh, ZEDC feature if you wanted to use that. So it's done automatically um, and it will use PDSE version two, but we don't compress program objects. If that's something that you need, let us know. We didn't think that program objects really needed to be compressed, but um, other things, you know, non-program objects, PDSE version two can optionally, optionally be compressed. SDSF has had a ton, a ton of new functions added to it. So we've got eight new primary displays that gives a lot more system information. We've got four new secondary supply displays that talk that do storage type of information. We've got new viewable fields, which lets you look at other storage and space as well. We've got a general help function. We can point and shoot fields for memory browsing. Uh, we've got even an entirely new display for system recovery boost, which is really nice given that we have a lot of boost types and you wanna see uh, what's going on to your system. This is a really nice way of doing it. So SDSF has just gone hog wild with new functions. In the area of networking, one of the most exciting things is ZERT. That's the Z. Uh, encryption readiness technology. It's a plugin into ZOSMF and you need DB2 in order to use this. And what it does is it processes SMF records and it will let you know any net analysis of all the incoming and outgoing TCP IP traffic into your environment such that you can see uh, if what kind of encryption might be used. What is new in ZOS 2.5 is that we can have policy-based enforcement now such that you could um, you know, stop a connection if it wasn't at a high enough encryption level for you know, your, your liking. So this is what's really interesting. Also, we have at the top here, we have some APARs so that you can customize 
how what the recording interval for Zert is, so that you don't are so you won't doing it too much too often, and that will help um, improve the performance of the anal analysis if you're not doing it all that often. So you can have it up to one call every 24 hours if you like. Shared memory communications was a big function also added into communication server. So for SMC, shared memory com communication, this is where you're sending data to and from ZOS on a high speed uh, method. And customers said, this is really good. We love SMC. However, we wanna put them on different subnets. And that's the capability that we can do here. It's done in two pieces. One of them is SMC uh, D direct and the other one is over Rocky. The two solutions were done in different ways, having different requirements associated with them. So we do have uh, multiple subnets that are supported with SMC now, which is really a wonderful function customers wanted that for. Now, a little function which has really been very helpful is that TCP IP is now going to issue an ENF and also a message when it is completely initialized. So above you would see that you would see the older message, you know, all TCP services for PROC TCP IP are available and dependencies that were on TCP IP sometimes would automate on that message and they would try to start up, but sometimes all the complete TCP IP functions weren't there, which would mean some of the extended services that it had. So when this function tried to start, it would find that it really wasn't completely available. And then that function would have to wait again and try again. And that would relate, uh, uh, result in delayed availability of that function. So now with the ENF and this extra message that says, you know, the TCP IP and extended service are now initialized for a particular stack, we can allow those dependent functions to know exactly when they should start so that they're starting correctly the first time, which is really cool. Okay, I'm going to go through the security pretty uh, well. I see we've got some questions, I think, maybe in the chat, but I haven't looked at them that, so let me get through the security uh, part before we look at the chat questions. So per pervasive encryption, as I said before, uh, we had just two spool encryption. We also allow encryption of basic and large format SMS managed data set that was rolled back to 2.3. We have EXC API support so that you can encrypt uh, data sets if you're using EXCP. And there is an entire content solution available for data set encryption if you wanted to take a look at that. More uh, enhancements coming into RACF pass tickets so you can have stronger encryption. We can configure the expiration time, more expanded character sets, better diagnostics, putting the information into SMF. Uh, and this is a good one that auditors wanted, which is support for a restricted profile management. So if a particular user into a discrete profile had alter access, they could al also change the profile. So a lot of people said, no, that's not good. You know, if you have alter access to the data set, you shouldn't be able to change the profile itself. So what we've done is we've created a new profile, which will then control all of the behavior of those discrete profiles where the users have alter access to see if they would be able to change the profile. And that new profile is in the facility. It's called IRR alter. And you can identify that particularly for particular classes. And then once you have locked that down so that nobody has access, people that had alter access couldn't change the profile, um, then you can permit individual users if you wanted them to have uh, the capability to change that profile. So this is pretty awesome stuff and it was done for auditors and I think they should like this. RACF's got new health checks. Uh, RACF also is changing the RACF sensitive resource health check. That one's kind of a got a grab bag, huge amount of items in it now, and we've got more items that you can see in here. So we make sure that all data sets are protected uh, by verifying the setter up, protect all failures option is set on. Uh, we're looking to make sure that the RACF address space is active and a couple of other items you can see here. We've got more certificate fingerprint support. Uh, so that you can display the certificate format. We're going to put it into SMF records that you can search it uh, in PKI services. And uh, this is supposed to help with the security policy administration so that you can see more information about the fingerprints. 
Uh, data privacy for diagnostics has been really important, especially uh, for GDPR kind of environments where you are not supposed to be sharing uh, personal information that might be provided into a dump, especially back to the software vendor. So the answer is data privacy for diagnostics. It's available on Z15 and higher. And what we have is an API within ZOS, which can identify particular areas of um, memory as sensitive so that when the dump is redacted, those particular memory uh, will not appear when you provide it to the software vendor. So how does it work? It's, it the, actually performs very well. We've had a lot of customers using this function and they do really like it. So what we had is the ability to tag it and those uh, tags are being used by particular exploiters. You take your dump as usual and it's captured with those tags inside of it. Then you have an, 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 an analyzer, excuse me, an analyzer which will run through that dump and it'll start to redact those areas that it knows about because it has been tagged. And then you have a separate dump that is a redacted area uh, dump that you can send then to the software vendor. Okay, and the performance on this, like I said, has been quite impressive and people are very happy about it. For the PTFs for this, we have a new fixed cat that you can see here. If you're interested in using this function and have a Z15, uh, put all the PTFs on for this and I think you'll like the function a lot. For application development, mostly it's all a lot, a lot about ZCX. We've had a lot of ZCX enhancements. So remember that ZCX was incorporated into ZOS 2.4 as a base function, and it allows you to run a Docker container inside a ZOS address space because uh, a Docker container that's a Linux for Z, Docker container, you can run it inside a ZOS address space. Basically, that's what ZCX is. There's a content solution. You can read all about that. We've had a lot of enhancements in performance so that we can offload about 95% of the ZCX work onto a zip. We are using single instruction multiple data, which has been uh, very helpful to us to have performance. We support large pages, both one meg and two gig. Uh, we have the increased number of data and swap disks for the appliance so that we can have up to 245. If you wanted to try it out for free, you could try it out for free with a 90 day trial. It's an update to IFA PRD PondLib member. And the ZCX function within the ZOS product itself is free. However, it has a dependency on either a hardware feature code available on Z14 or higher, which is 0104, or if you don't wanna purchase the hardware feature code, the new news is that you can purchase a software product called the Container Hosting Foundation product. And that will allow that dependency to be met with software instead of the hardware um, so that you can purchase that with an, in an MLC type of fashion to use that function. Okay, But remember, if you want to have the 90 day trial, you can definitely do that as well. Also, we've added support for IPv6. Okay. This one. ISPF, we've had a ton of uh, requests for RFEs for ISPF in order to do PDSE member generation so that you can see it in ISPF. And finally, that has been delivered as well, as well as the ability to submit a job to the uh, just to emergency subsys. So you'll have the subsys parameter on there in order to use that as well. One note about Java, although Java is not in the operating system, remember, we will go out ZOS 2.5 supporting Java 8, but Java 8 will be end of service during the life of 2.5. And so us, just like any other Java user, will find ourselves having to move from Java 8 to Java 11 during our life cycle. So this is just a heads up that we will give you ample warning that when we move from a dependency on Java 8 to Java 11, we will let you know. Okay, so just keep an eye on that. We are just like everybody else, when Java goes out of service, we also have to move up to Java 11. If you haven't seen something here you like, we have a lot of customer RFEs and you're welcome to open up more. I thank you very much. I think I have probably one minute to do some questions. So let's look at the chat if we can. Thanks, Mara. I'll shout them out for you if you want. Okay. So we had a question from Colin. If using DB2 uh, with DB2 sort to speed up utilities, do we get any benefits from the new sort features? Or do oh, they only apply to DF sort? 
That is a wonderful question, Colin. I don't want to speculate. I think I know the answer to that, but I don't know for sure. Colin, if you wouldn't mind sending me an email and I know the, exactly the right person to ask for that. Um, and that, that's a very good question. And please email me. Let me, um, my email is mwalle at us.ibm.com. Please send that to me and I can get you an answer right away. I know exactly who can answer that. I think I know the answer, but I'm not going to guess. <laughs> Okie doke. Very, very quickly. Next one from Bill. ZOSMF have been using XML for workflows, for example. Now we see more use of JSON. Any plans to migrate workflows to that format too? No, uh, the, the ZOSMF workflows will remain an XML type of format. I haven't seen anything from the ZOSMF workflow engine saying we want to move to it. Um, really, when you think about the workflow definition file, it's not really a human kind of readable file. So I'm not sure why it would matter whether it was XML or JSON. Uh, maybe if there was a better performing reason for it, we might do the conversion or something. But since it's really not a human readable, so to speak, file, I haven't seen any movement at all in that area or even plans to do it. So it'll stay XML for for the foreseeable future, I see, unless we can see of a reason why it why it needed to move to JSON, and I don't see a reason there today. And I think there's one more question, but a slightly tongue-in-cheek one um, from Marcus. Can you run a ZOS ZD and instance on Linux in a ZCX instance running on a ZOS zip? Okay, so uh, that is a really good question. You're talking about simulation on top of simulation on top of simulation. Yeah. Um, so this is down on a ZD and T system. I'm not so familiar with the ZD and T. Um, I'm not really sure the answer to that one. If you want to email me that question, I will. But I, I would imagine just this is not going to perform very well at all, looking at how many layers you have. Um, of simulation going on on that. I would not think that that would be probably something you'd like the behavior of if you were able to do it. I would say you could probably try it, um, but I don't think you would like the performance of it. So why don't you drop me a line and I'll, I'll get you a, a straight answer on that. But I, on the top of my head, I don't think that's probably something that you'd even think that the performance of it would be acceptable. Okie doke. And I think one last question there from Ron. The ZOSMF uh, network configuration will not support import of active policy anymore. What well, is the good replacement? Good question. Um, okay, the network configuration assistant is only for the policy agent portion of that function of ZOSMF. And so you must import them before you get to ZOS 2.5. So the replacement is you don't get to do the import anymore. They have to be done. They would have to be, if you hadn't done the import before 2.5, uh, you would have to somehow start a new one, which would be not good. <laughs> so you must do that import before you get to 2.5. Remember, this does not affect TCP IP stack definitions. This is only the policy agent portion of the network configuration assistant. So you must do the import if you had any that you did not yet have imported. So the replacement is, you know, the I guess configure a new one, but probably nobody's doing that. So if you had any that you wanted imported, you would have to do that now. Um, there isn't any other method to do it. And again, remember, TCP/IP is not a, not affected at all. This TCP/IP, you can still do the import of that stack definition. If you have any more questions on that, Ron, let me know. Um, I didn't. I haven't ever heard that question before, so it makes me think that. Um, most people have already done their import and that this hasn't been a problem for not allowing them to do new imports into it. Okay, any other questions? Not at the minute. I, I, I thank you all very much. I know I've gone through the information very fast. There is a lot of information in the PDF that I've already uploaded. So hopefully that is um, gives you some more information. You know, with that, Mana, thank you very, very much. Uh, always a great session. So, yeah, um, I think our next one is with Steve Warren, Parallel Sysplex update at 2 p.m. So we'll see you all for that. Thanks and uh, enjoy the break. Cheers. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.